students welcome to physics class and today we will study the unit magnetism so whenever there is a static charge which is represented with the symbol small q then it produces electric field but if this charge q is moving then in addition to the electric field it also produces a magnetic field so a static charge has only electric field but a moving charge has electric field as well as magnetic field electric field is represented with the symbol capital e and it is a function of the position r similarly the magnetic field is represented with the symbol capital p and it is also a function of the position r so electric field is capital e and magnetic field is capital b and both are the functions of position r electric field follows the principle of superposition if you want to know what is this principle how electric field follows the principle of superposition you can refer to our lecture the link is given below this lecture you can quickly move and here we want to say that as electric field follows the superposition principle the magnetic field similarly follows the superposition principle what does it mean that if you are having a magnetic field due to number of components then the total magnetic field is the sum of all those that is the vector sum of all those small small independent values that is known as a principle of superposition so whatever the superposition principle is followed by electric field similarly it is also followed by magnetic field the formula for electric field is e is equal to k q upon r square and the value of q is 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught so it may be written as q upon 4 pi epsilon naught r square and the direction is r cap which is a unit factor and if you want to go to the electric force then f is given as q e this e is generated due to the source charge and this is the test charge so whatever is the force on the test charge is f is equal to qe so here you can substitute the value of e so that comes out to be q q upon 4 pi epsilon naught r squared in the direction is r cap similarly for the magnetic field similarly for the magnetic field the force f is given as q v cross b and this force we call as lorentz force so let us start up with this lorentz force what is this force which is acting due to magnetic field and how we get this formula and how to use this formula so let us understand what is this lorentz force to understand lorentz force we take a point charge small q and since the lorentz force which is a force due to electric field as well as magnetic field so this charge q should be moving so this charge q is moving with the velocity v and at any time t the position vector of this charge q is given by small r and since this charge is moving so electric field is present as well as magnetic field is present so the total force on this moving charge which is moving with the velocity v is given by this charge q multiplied with the electric field so the position of r because this is moving this charge is present so it will create an electric field and it is moving so it will also create a magnetic field so in addition to electric field we have a magnetic field so what do we add we add a cross multiplication of this velocity with with the magnetic field so this is our electric field so this is our electric force qe and this is our magnetic force q v cross b that is a magnetic force so this total force f which is the sum of electric force and magnetic force is called lorentz force by the name lorentz because of the name of the scientist so whenever you have to use a lorentz force simply write down is the sum of electric field and magnetic field electric field is f is equal to q into e and magnetic field is f is equal to q v cross b 
So if you sum these two, you will have a resultant force which is known as a Lorentz force. Now this Lorentz force has certain properties. First property is because F is given in the formula F is equal to Q E plus V cross B. So this is our Lorentz force depends on Q, it depends on velocity V, it depends on electric field E and it depends on magnetic field B. So these are the four quantities this field depends on. So if the charge is negative, if the polarity of this Q is negative, then this force becomes F is equal to minus Q E plus V cross B. So for negative charge, since force is a vector quantity, so the force is in the opposite direction to that of the positive charge. That is the first property. Second property is, if the charge is not moving, that means the velocity V is zero. So if V is zero, then this magnetic field component will be zero. Then we will have only the electric field F, that is the Lorentz force reduces to the electric force only. There will be no magnetic pole if the charge is not moving. If we talk only about the magnetic force, then F is equal to Q V cross B. There is a cross multiplication between the velocity V and the magnetic field B. So if you take a cross product, it comes out to be Q V B sine theta. So F is in perpendicular direction to both the velocity V and the magnetic field B. Because in the cross product, whenever a vector quantity is a resultant of the cross product of two vector quantities, then the direction of this quantity is always perpendicular to these two. That is the thumb rule. Always, always, always remember this rule that here the force will be perpendicular to the velocity V as well as the magnetic field B. And the angle between them is say theta because V cross B we have taken as VB sine theta. So the angle between V and B is theta. So whatever is there, if the angle is zero, theta is equal to zero degree, that means V and B are both in the same direction, then what will happen? The force is equal to zero. Similarly, if these are anti-parallel to, these two are exactly in the opposite direction, then 180 degree, sine zero is zero, sine 180 is zero, then again we get the magnetic force as zero in these two conditions. But if the angle is theta, it is not zero, this is 180 degree, then angle is having the value except these two values, then how to find out? Then we use a rule that is known as a right hand screw rule. So I'm trying to show you of what is this right hand screw rule is. You might have already studied in your previous class, but for now just to understand the direction of force, have a quick look at that. I will try to explain it in the easiest way possible. Suppose this is a charge plus Q, that is a small Q. It is moving along, say, this direction. So this is the direction of the velocity of this charge. And say in this direction is, and say in this direction is the magnetic field, then the force will be along the perpendicular direction. This will be the direction of our force. Because V and B are in this plane, as you can see, this is the plane I have drawn, then the F will be perpendicular to this. Now, the question that should arise in your mind that why F is this upward, why F is not downward, then you have to use the right hand screw rule. Listen carefully. What you have to do, use your right hand and spread your fingers in the direction of the velocity, in which direction the charge Q is moving. So spread your right hand fingers in the direction of velocity and fold them in the direction of the magnetic field. Keep your thumb open. Point your fingers toward the direction of velocity and fold your fingers towards your palm in the direction of magnetic field. And in which direction your thumb is pointing is the direction of the force. Right? So spread your fingers in the direction of V and fold them in the direction of V. Then your thumb will be always upward. So that shows the direction of the magnetic force. 
and this is our right hand screw rule. So whenever you are using to find the direction of this magnetic field, always use this right hand screw rule. Now the fourth point is The magnetic field B is given by B is equal to F upon QV. Now this force is a Newton. If you want to write on the units, the force is a Newton. Our charge is in Coulomb, and the velocity is in meter per second. So that is how we have written according to this formula, force Newton, this is Coulomb and this is meter per second. So this should be the unit of magnetic field. And uh, this whole we call as Tesla. Tesla is again the name of the scientist from which we got this unit. So the unit is Tesla and we represent Tesla with the symbol capital T. So whenever you are calculating the magnetic field, use the Unit is Tesla and capital T is used for representation. And another use because Tesla is very larger unit, so we use the common unit for measuring the magnetic field is Gauss. That's a different scientist, but the unit is Gauss. So magnetic field is having the unit of Gauss that is a more popular unit. And this Gauss, if you want to write down in terms of Tesla, this Gauss is always 10 to the power minus 4 Tesla. Remember this, 1 Gauss is equal to 10 to the power minus 4 Tesla. How big this Tesla is, if you want to know, say for example, uh, you can take the example of our Earth. So the Earth's magnetic field is approximately 3.6 into 10 to the power minus 5 Tesla. So this big Tesla unit is, so that is why we use Gauss. So these are the four properties of the Lorentz force. Now we know the formula, we know the unit, we know how to find the direction. That means now we are almost done with the magnetic force. So now we know the magnetic field, so we can calculate the magnetic field of a conductor who is carrying current. So let us say this is a conductor which is carrying the current. This is a conductor, so we can say this is an any metal rod, and the length of this rod is say small l, and the area is say capital A. That is a cross section area. It is having a uniform cross section area. That means it has equal thickness from throughout the length. So this uniform cross section area is A, and the length is small l. And this is carrying the current capital I. Since it's a conductor, so it will be carrying charge carriers or electrons. So say that the density of these charge carriers is small n. So small n is the density of charge carriers or density of electrons. So this is the density. Now we want to calculate the total number of charge carriers which are moving. This is the density. So if you multiply this density with the cross section area and the length, density means this is the number of charge carriers per unit volume. So if this per unit volume quantity, if you multiply with the volume, you will have the total number of charge carriers. So n is the number of charge carriers per unit volume. And this A into L is the volume because L is the length, A is the cross section. So if you multiply this length with the cross section, you will have the volume. So V is equal to A into L. So we have multiplied this density, number of charge carriers per unit volume with the volume. So that is the total number of mobile charge carriers, moving charge carriers, which are the electrons. Now if the magnetic field B is acting and these charges are moving, then they are always moving with the drift velocity. We have already started this drift velocity in our earlier unit. If you want to go into the detail, what is this drift velocity, what is the formula, that is a very, very important quantity for all of your competitive exams as well as your 12. So if you want to go, then the lecture, the link for the lecture is given below. So you can go through quickly and you can find out what is this drift velocity. So in the presence of magnetic field, all these electrons are moving with the drift velocity. So the force which is acting on the charge carriers is 
This is the number of charge carriers, total number of charge carriers. And each charge carrier is having the charge Q, say. So this is Q, V cross B. The velocity is the drift velocity and B is the magnetic field. So that is the magnetic force formula we got from the Lorentz force. So this F is equal to Q, V cross B. Number of charge carriers multiply with the charge. So that is Q, V cross B. So there is the total force on the charge carriers. Now if you want to calculate the current density. Since I is the symbol for the current, so we use the symbol J for the current density. And the current density is given as number of charge carriers per unit volume into the charge and multiplied with the drift velocity. So this quantity, this and Q and drift velocity, we can replace with J. That is the current density. So our force comes out to be current density J. And we are left with AL cross B. Because this is a scalar quantity, this is a scalar quantity. So we are left with only J multiplied with AL cross B. And J dot A will give you the current. So this is I L cross B. So this is another formula for the force, which is a magnetic force, which is acting on a charge carrying conductor. So whenever you are having any current I, then you use the formula I L cross B. If you are having the charge, then use the formula Q V cross B. If you are having the current, then use the formula I L cross B. Here B is the external magnetic field and it is not produced by the current carrying rod. This is not due to this moving charges, but this is the external magnetic field. Always remember this B is the external magnetic field in the formula F is equal to I L cross B. So this is another important formula you should keep in mind for the magnetic force whenever you are having a current. So this is an important formula. So these are the two important formula for the magnetic force. Now let us quickly also learn about the magnetic field. So let us know what is this magnetic field. Magnetic field was, you can say, first of all, it was experienced by the scientist Oersted. So Oersted finds that all the moving charges, or we can call them as currents, they produce a magnetic field in the surrounding space. Right? So here I have shown these, the middle one, and the current carrying wire. This is a long, straight current carrying wire. Here in this case, this is perpendicular to the plane of the paper. And surrounding this, we keep a ring of compass meters. This is a compass which shows a north south direction. You might have used compass in your daily life or maybe in your physics lab where the needle points out in north and south direction. So this north I am trying to show with the blue and south is with the white. So this is a compass needle. And if there is a long current carrying wire like this, which is going away from the which is perpendicular to the plane of this paper, then the compass needle and it is the current is flowing through it, then the compass needle which shows the presence of magnetic field, they are directed like this. And if here the current is moving in the upward direction, that means it is coming out, the current is flowing away. It is coming out from the paper, it's perpendicular to the plane, then the compass needles arranged shows the magnetic field in this direction. Wherever with the cross we always shows into the papers that is the current is moving into the plane of the paper. It is going into in the downward direction. Then the compass needle shows the magnetic field along this direction. So that is the only difference. Otherwise we can say that like the electric field lines, we also have the magnetic field lines. So this magnetic field, it has also lines like the electric fields. So if you take a current carrying wire which is going away from the plane of the paper, that is away from this, then if you can use iron fillings, these iron fillings, these are a magnetic material which are quickly attracted towards the magnet. So if you keep iron fillings, then they form the magnetic field lines. So we can quickly make some magnetic field lines as such.
which are concentric circles. So here in the middle we have a current carrying wire which is coming out from the plane of the paper and you keep iron filling around us then you get these as the path because this iron filling they are arranged in this manner which shows the magnetic field lines. So all these concentric circles shows the magnetic field lines due to this current carrying wire. So here it simply shows the, magnetic, the presence of magnetic field lines and here you can see the direction because the magnetic field lines also the magnetic field lines always flow from north to south. So this is our south and this is north. So they are flowing from north to south. This way, north to south, north to south, north to south. So we get your thumb like this and here they are flowing from north to south. So here you can see this will be in the downward. So that is how you can show the magnetic compass needles for a current carrying wire into from away from the plane into the plane and these are the iron fillings. And these are the compass needles, but always remember these magnetic field lines, they always flow from north to south. Always remember this thumb rule for the magnetic field lines. So this is what you should always remember that these magnetic field lines flows from north to south. Now here again we want to move a charge Q in the magnetic field. So if this charge Q is moving in the magnetic field, now obviously the force that would be acting is the Lorentz force. And from the Lorentz force, you can get the magnetic force F is equal to Q into V cross V. So for that we should have some external magnetic field. So let us say that we are having some external magnetic field. So the force so here we have shown this is a magnetic field which is into the plane of the paper so that shows B magnetic field and here we may be having a charge plus Q which is moving so this charge plus Q is moving in the magnetic field external magnetic field if it is moving in the external magnetic field and the force which is acting on this charge Q is equal to Q into V cross B where V is the velocity and V is the external magnetic field we have applied. So we want to consider two cases. First of all, when P and P are perpendicular to each other. This is the first case when B, v is perpendicular to B. So if we calculate the force F is equal to Q, then B, B sine theta, and this theta is 90 degree, then sine 90 is 1, so F is equal to Q, V, B. Right? So how you represent? So here we have shown that the magnetic field which is shown in green color, it is the direction is into the plane of the paper. That means it is downward. So we have shown it with a cross. So whenever you represent with a dot, it is outward. And whenever you represent with a cross, it always shows inward. So here the magnetic field is downward. And there is a charge Q which is moving. So the velocity is in the plane. You can say at this point it is into the plane of the paper. It is in the plane of the paper and it is into the plane of the paper. So in each case B is perpendicular to B. So this is the direction of B is inward and the V is in the plane of the paper. So if you get V cross B. So just spread your fingers in the direction of V and pull them in B. So whatever you got is the direction of the force. So here the force will be perpendicular to these two, perpendicular to B and perpendicular to V. So this is the direction of force. In this case, this will be the direction of force. And in this case, this will be the direction of force. So as you can see that in each case, F is perpendicular to V, also it is perpendicular to B. F is perpendicular to V as well as B. F is perpendicular to V as well as B. So there is always a force which is acting inward if this charge is moving along this path. So the force which always act towards the center of a circular motion is a centripetal force. So in this case the force F acts as a centripetal force. It produces a circular motion
perpendicular to magnetic field. The direction of magnetic field, so there is a circular motion, there is a centripetal force which is acting. So whenever V and B are perpendicular, then in this case, you will always have a circular motion. There is a centripetal force, which is a magnetic force. This magnetic force acts as a centripetal force and the circular motion perpendicular to the direction of B. So always remember that for this magnetic field and velocity are exactly perpendicular, then the force act as a centripetal force and the motion is a circular motion. So what we conclude from this? If the charged particle moves along a circle, if velocity is perpendicular to magnetic field, if V and B are perpendicular, then the charged particle moves along a circle. Now we'll consider the second case when V and B are not exactly perpendicular to each other. So let us move to case two. So here in this figure, if you want to apply the rule we have studied for the direction of force, that is a Lorentz force. So you just use the thumb rule, say for this, use your right hand, spread your fingers in the direction of the velocity V and fold them in the downward direction. Right, so finger would be facing towards your face. So the direction of force is the direction of your thumb, that is inward. And if you come to the second point, at this lower point, again you have to spread your fingers in the direction of V and bend them downward so that the thumb is against you. So that again shows the direction of force. And at third point, if you come, just spread your right hand fingers in the direction of velocity V and fold them downward so that the thumb will be pointing towards your left hand. So this way you can calculate at each point of this circular motion, each point you can calculate the direction of force and each point you will get it towards the center. So this rule is applicable everywhere, wherever you will use Lorentz law, you can apply this right hand thumb rule and I have given you the secret of this that spread your fingers in the direction of velocity and turn them, fold them in the direction of magnetic field. So you will always get the right direction of Magnetic force as correct. Magnetic force as correct. So let us move to the second point where again you will using the same right hand screw rule. So let us go to the second point. In the second point we have to draw when our velocity V is not exactly perpendicular. There is an angle between V and B. There is an angle theta between V and B. So let us see how it works. So here as you can see we have shown all the three axes that is a coordinate system I have drawn. So here I have drawn a coordinate system you can see x, y and z and the magnetic field is along x direction so our magnetic field is in the x direction. And velocity v is at any angle theta. So say this is the direction of V, that is the direction of the velocity, the motion of the particle, this charge plus Q and it is moving. So this point it shows the direction of the movement of the particle, that is the velocity of the particle. Now it is at angle some theta with respect to B. So now we can take the components of the velocity. So this is the perpendicular component, that is the normal component and this is the horizontal component. So this is I have shown as a parallel component and this is the perpendicular component, right? So if the velocity V is at an angle theta with the magnetic field B, then we have to take the components of the velocity, right? So these two shows the parallel and the perpendicular component. Now, this parallel component is along the direction of the magnetic field B, so it is unchanged. This component is unchanged because the motion is along the magnetic field which is not affected by the magnetic field. So we can say that the parallel component, the velocity is in the direction of magnetic field, so it is not affected. So it is not affected by B. But if you come to the perpendicular component of the velocity, then this is in the plane which is perpendicular to the direction of magnetic field because the magnetic field is along x direction. 
and the perpendicular component is in the plane that is perpendicular to this x so what happens this component allows the particle to move along x direction in the direction of magnetic field and this is the perpendicular component so for this parallel component in the magnetic field these two are perpendicular to each other so they follows case 1 what happens in case 1 that if v and b are mutually perpendicular then the path is circular here in this case v perpendicular and magnetic field b are perpendicular to each other so these two will follow case 1 that means the motion will be circular so the perpendicular component causes the circular motion of the charged particle and the parallel component causes the motion of the charged particle in the direction of magnetic field so these two are working in two different ways so as a result what we have we have a helical motion that the circular path is followed but in the same time simultaneously particle is also moving in the direction of magnetic field circular motion moving along x direction circular motion moving along the x direction circular motion moving along the x direction so what we have the resultant is a helical path like this this we call is a helical path so the particle follows a helical path here i have shown the helical path of this charged particle q so whenever v is at any angle with the magnetic field b then the two components works different in two different ways and the result of these two different ways that we get the helical motion of the charged particle i hope now it is very much easy for you to understand how the helical path is followed what is the reason behind the helical path so this is the reason behind the helical path so this shows a circular path and from the midpoint if we take then it shows the radius so since this is a helical path that means the circular path which is continuously moving along any direction so here this direction is x so if this is circular motion always there is a always there will be a centripetal force so we write down the formula for centripetal force so we know that the centripetal force is given to the formula f is equal to mv square upon r this is the formula for the centripetal force so this centripetal force is coming from the magnetic force and we know that magnetic force if you want to calculate then we have to simply use the Lorentz force so the magnetic force that will be working on this charged particle q will be always QVB right so this is a centripetal force because of the circular motion this is a magnetic force because the particle is moving in a magnetic field so these two force the centripetal force is arising from the magnetic force so we can equate these two forces so on equating the centripetal force and magnetic force what we get is centripetal force is equal to magnetic force so this v square is here so this one cancels out with this v and what we have as a resultant that r is the radius which comes equal to mv upon qb so this is the radius of the helical path so the radius of the helical path is equal to mv upon qb and mv we always found for the momentum so mv is equal to the moment of the particle and r is the radius of this helix so as we see the radius of the helix depends on the momentum mv that means if the velocity is large or the momentum is large for the particle then the radius would also be large so we can conclude that it will have a large radius for large momentum so this formula r is equal to mv upon qb is very important whenever you are talking about a particle which is moving in a magnetic field at any angle theta between the velocity and v or wherever there is a helical motion then the radius is calculated only using this formula now since there is a circular motion and we are using the velocity v so this velocity v is related to this angular momentum as v is equal to omega r that is a well known relation from our previous classes that v is equal to omega r and this omega is equal to 2 pi nu where nu is the frequency where omega is the angular momentum and nu is the frequency so from here we can say that angular velocity is equal to omega is equal to v upon r and the value is and the value of v is qb upon mr so we can write down the value of v from this equation r is equal to mv upon qb so v comes out to be qbr upon m so r cancels out and we are left with qb upon m
So this omega is equal to QB upon n and omega is also equal to 2 pi nu, nu is a frequency. So this is QB upon m. If we equate these two values of omega, we get omega is equal to QB upon m. Here nu is a frequency of rotation. That is again very much known to us that nu is a frequency of rotation in this case. So from a single formula, we have only equated centripetal force with the magnetic force. Now we know the radius. Now we know the momentum. And now we know the angular frequency. And now we know the frequency of rotation. We know the angular velocity and frequency of rotation. Now if we know omega, we can also calculate the time period. Time period is denoted with the symbol capital T. And the formula to calculate T is T is equal to 2 pi upon omega. All my physics students, all my science students, you are very much familiar from your previous classes that t is equal to 2 pi upon omega. Now the value of omega is known to us and we can put the value, just put the value of omega. It's 2 pi upon omega is having the value qb upon m. So t is equal to 2 pi m upon qb that relation we are getting for the time period. So we have derived two very important relation for the helical motion and if the frequency is known to you and if the frequency is known to you then you can also write down the time period t is equal to 1 upon nu because frequency and time period are inversely related to each other so t is equal to 1 upon nu. Another important thing we have to calculate in this derivation is the distance travel in one rotation. This is a one rotation. So in a single rotation, if I start from this point and I come back to this point, so this is a single rotation like this. So in a single rotation, how much we have traveled in the direction of magnetic field? So that is known as pitch. So now we will define pitch. So what is a pitch? We can define pitch as distance moved along the magnetic field in one rotation. Pitch is denoted with the symbol capital P. So if you want to calculate P, then we see that the distance travel will be equal to the velocity into time. And the time taken for one rotation is always the time period. So this is T. And the component of velocity in the direction of magnetic field is V parallel. So this pitch is the distance. So we have simply used the formula distance is equal to velocity multiplied with time. So the distance we are calling as pitch. So pitch is equal to the component of velocity v parallel and the time is a time period that is for one rotation. So if we multiply this parallel component of velocity with the time period, we will have the pitch. So this v parallel we will write on as such because it is a parallel component of the velocity and t we have just calculated the formula of t is 2 pi m upon qb. So put the value of t 2 pi m upon qb. So that implies that the formula for pitch comes out to be 2 pi m v parallel upon qb. Right? So these are the three important formulas we have derived for the helical motion. So whenever we are having a helical motion, we need to calculate the radius, we need to calculate the time period and we need to calculate the pitch. The only thing you have to keep in mind for this derivation is that the parallel component of velocity that is V parallel will make the particle move along the magnetic field and the perpendicular component V perpendicular will make a circular motion and as a result the part of the particle will become helical. So these are the two types we have done for the magnetic field when V is perpendicular to B or V is at any angle to the magnetic field B. Now we will do the motion of the particle when there is electric field as well as magnetic field. So we consider a charge small q which is moving with the velocity V in the presence of electric field and magnetic field. Electric field is denoted with the symbol E and this electric field is along the y direction and the magnetic field is denoted with P and this is along Z direction and the particle is moving along X direction. So the velocity is along X direction. So we can say that V is in along X direction, E is along Y direction and V is along Z direction and all these are for the charge small q. So this charge small q will experience electric field as well as magnetic field. So the force we can calculate is simply using the Lorentz force. 
so we can write on the lorentz force that is acting on this charge small q so lorentz force f is equal to small q then due to electric field e plus due to magnetic field v cross b so that is the magnitude of lorentz force that is acting on this charge small q so this is the sum of electric force and magnetic force right so the total force is the sum of electric force and magnetic force now here we see that this e electric field e is perpendicular to the magnetic field b this is along y direction and this is along z direction so e is perpendicular to b electric field is perpendicular to the magnetic field and these are also perpendicular to the velocity v these three are mutually perpendicular to each other so now we can write down in the components form so if v is along x direction so we can write down v as i cap v and electric field is along y direction so we can write down e as j cap e and b is along z direction so we can write down b as k, k cap b so this i cap j cap k cap are the unit vectors which shows the direction and v e b are the magnitudes of velocity electric field and magnetic field so the electric force if we denote it with f e then electric force from lorentz force if you see this equation then the electric force f e is equal to q into e so we can write down q into e as j cap q e because e we can write down as j cap e so this f e is equal to j cap q e similarly if you write down the magnetic field f p then magnetic field is q v cross b that is q v b sin theta so if we write it down in the component form then this v may be written as i cap v cross k cap b so this i cap cross k cap is minus j cap right and if you don't remember just simply go to this the small trick i j and k and we move like this you have to move in a single direction then i cross j is k j cross k is i and k cross i is j and here we are doing i cross k so i cross k so we are moving in the opposite direction and if we are moving in the opposite direction then the result will be minus sign so i cross k is minus j cap this is simple rule we have to follow right this is from our previous class but i am just reminding you that how we got this minus j cap so the resultant magnetic force is minus j cap q v b so if we calculate the total force that is the sum of electric force and magnetic force we get them as put the value this is j cap q e and this is minus j cap q v b so we can take this j cap and q as common because it is present in both the term and here we have e minus v b that is a resultant force now since our electric field and magnetic field these are in the opposite direction so if their magnitudes are same that means e is equal to b then the total force will be equal to zero the electric force and magnetic force are acting in the opposite direction and if their magnitude is same that means the resultant force so the total force on q is zero and charge q will move undeflected it will only move along x direction there is no deflection towards y direction or z direction or z direction because e and b are same in magnitude so whenever these are two same in magnitude then is there is no deflection and our particle that is a charged particle of small q it will move undeflected along x direction along the direction of velocity so in that case if the electric force is equal to magnetic force then q is equal to q v b so that means v is equal to e upon b so what we can see here 
that if we have cross electric and magnetic field that means electric field and magnetic field in the opposite direction that we call as cross electric and magnetic field so whenever we have cross electric and magnetic field it serves as a velocity selector and particles of particular velocity can be selected because here in this case it does not depend on the charge q and mass m the particles with speed e upon v as we can see from this derivation from this formula that the velocity is the ratio of electric field to magnetic field so the velocity is not a function of the charge u it is not a function of the mass of the charge it only depends on the speed e upon v so only the particles with speed e upon v pass undeflected through the region of cross field so whenever we have this e and b cross then we can select the particle of particular velocity v having e upon b so this works as a velocity selector this is the application of whenever we are having cross electric and magnetic field so whenever it is asked to use that what is the use of having a charged particle moving in cross electric and magnetic field then simply remember this formula that it can be used as a velocity selector for the particles now we move to an application of this and this application is known as cyclotron so let us move to what is a cyclotron so before knowing about cyclotron we will first study the steps what are the steps first we will study what is cyclotron second we will study how does the cyclotron works and third we will study is the mechanism of working of the cyclotron so let us come to the first question that what is cyclotron that is our first part what is cyclotron so cyclotron is a machine which uses both electric and magnetic field perpendicular to each other to accelerate charged particle or to accelerate ions to higher energies so whenever we want to increase the energy of the charged particle or the ions then we make them pass through the combined electric and magnetic field the cross electric and magnetic field and that way we can accelerate these particles or these ions to higher energies so that is the use of this machine which we call as cyclotron second part is what is the principle of cyclotron so the cyclotron works on the principle of cross electric and magnetic field in cyclotron the particle move inside two semicircular disk which we call as d's and in the boxes the particle is shielded as it is not acted by the electric fields and the electric field is changed alternately in the time with the circular motion of the particle so that is the principle of working of the cyclotron so now we know what is cyclotron how does it work so let us go to the construction of cyclotron and then we will study how it works so in this structure we can see a cyclotron and the important structure of this cyclotron these are two metal containers which we have shown as d1 and d2 because these are of the alphabet d in shape so these are two are called as 2d's actually these are metal containers which we call as d so we have 2d's here and here we use the oscillator through the oscillator a high frequency alternating voltage that is ac voltage is supplied to these 2d's it is a high frequency ac voltage and here at the center p this center we are calling as p you can see a dot this is the center and here we are having this is a charge particle which are a positively charged particle this may be any positive charge particle for example you can take as proton and this positive charge particle these are released in the presence of electric and magnetic field magnetic field we have shown with these small dots so this shows the magnetic field and it is out of the plane that means it is the outward direction if you see this paper then it is out of the paper coming in the outward direction because dot shows the outward direction and cross so shows the inward direction so this electric field is due to the voltage and magnetic field is applied in the outward direction and from the center p we are releasing 
any positively charged particles so what happens when this positive charged particle are released they move in the d in the semicircular part these are in the semicircular part because electric field and magnetic field these two are perpendicular to each other so whenever these are released from the center p then they follow the circular path and they move in the d so for each of the d they move in the semicircular path and arrive in the gap between d so say this is a semicircular path and after the semicircular path they arrive in the gap here you can see this is the gap so after that this charged particle arrive in the gap between these two d this is the gap if you can see you see this dot which is moving so this shows the gap between these two so the particle when it arrives in the gap between these two d's then this time is t by 2 so between the two d's it is t by 2 that is the half of the total time period they remain in this gap between two d's and if you want to calculate the time of revolution t then it will be 1 upon frequency because this is related to the machine cyclotron so we call it as a cyclotron frequency so this is frequency and c suffix corresponds to the cyclotron frequency and we have just derived the formula that whenever these are following any helical path then we got the time period t is equal to 2 pi m upon q b we have just derived so the similar formula will work here in this case so we can use the time period t as 2 pi m upon q b because cyclotron is a machine which works on this principle so we can direct away use this formula and this voltage alternating voltage we are applying this is chosen so that the polarity of d is reversed in the same time taken by ions or the charged particle to complete half of the revolution see we have released it here then semi one semicircular path it is following in this d and then it is in the gap here so this is t by 2 then this voltage is alternate because these are the positively charged particle then this is given with the negative voltage so they are attracted towards this d again they move here and they follow the semicircular path then they comes in the gap between d then the voltage is altered now this d is given negative voltage so all those positive charged particles they will enter into this d again they will follow the semicircular path and comes in the gap between these two d's then this becomes negative and they are come and they come to the first d and this way it continues that they are following this spiral path in both the d's so we apply this voltage such that the polarity of d is reversed in the same time taken by the charged particle to complete one half of the revolution so as soon as this one half of the revolution is completed the semicircular path is completed this d will become negative so the charged particle which are positively charged particle they will complete one semicircular path here and when they again come to the gap then this d is the voltage is reversed then this d is become negative so they are moving the semicircular path again so this process continues continues and this charged particles their energy increases because their spiral path increases so the semicircular path increases and this continues and until this charged particles have the energy required to have a radius approximately equal to the radius of the d's so when this radius of this moving charged particle this radius from the center is approximately equal to d till then this continues and what happens we choose the phase of supply such that when the particle travel in the region free of the electric field then the increase in their energy is q into v each time because inside this t they are shielded with the electric field there is no electric field which is acting on these charged particle inside the d's so here they are moving and when they come here then their energy is increased by q into v so each revolution will make an increase in the energy of the charged particle by q into v so this is our cyclotron frequency and the ac voltage which we are applying that is a high alternating voltage say the frequency of this voltage is a that is for the applied voltage and in this condition when this applied voltage frequency is equal to the cyclotron frequency then this is known as the condition of resonance when the applied voltage frequency equals to the cyclotron frequency this condition is known as resonance condition 
so what happens what we can say that by alternating voltage the sign of electric field is changed alternately in time with the circular motion of the particle and that ensures that a particle is always accelerated by the electric field each time the acceleration increases the energy of the particle the radius of the circular path also increases and the path is of spiral shape and this whole of the assembly this is cyclotron you can see this is evacuated it is vacuumed it is made free of air to minimize collisions between the air molecules or the charged particle or ions so we have vacuum inside so that our charged particles or ions can move freely inside the dies and outside the dies whenever the electric field is acting their energy is increasing their radius is increasing and they are following the spiral path So what we can say that the ions are or the charged particles are repeatedly accelerated across these two Ds until they have the required energy to have the radius approximately equal to the radius of the Ds. And when their radius is approximately equal to the radius of the D, then they are deflected by the magnetic field and they leave the system via the exit slit. There is an exit port you can see in the diagram. So whenever this radius of the moving charge particle is equal to approximately equal to the radius of the Ds, then there is an exit port and through this exit slit, they come out of the system. And the velocity of these charge particles we can write down as V is equal to QBR upon M. We have just derived. So, it will be the same as for we have derived for the helical motion. Similarly, we can write on this for the spiral motion. All the formulas hold true for the cyclotron is just an application of what we studied. And from here, we can calculate the radius because this is the charge particles charge, this is the magnetic field, this is the mass and this is the radius. So, we can say that when this radius is equal to the radius of the D, when the small r is equal to capital R, then the velocity will be equal to QBR upon M from the same formula and using this formula we can also calculate the radius when it is when the charged particle is exited out then this radius will be equal to MV upon QB so from this formula we can calculate the radius so this will give us the velocity and this will give us the radius so this is how this machine works. We know the principle. We know how it works. We know all the formulas related to it. We know the velocity. We know the radius. And one more thing, one more important thing we can easily calculate because whenever you know the velocity, you can calculate the kinetic energy. So whenever the charged particles or ions are coming out, they are moving, then their kinetic energy can be easily calculated using the same formula for velocity. We know that kinetic energy is equal to half mv squared. The formula of v is known to us. So just put the value of half m, this is q square, b square, r square upon 2m. Upon m square, so that comes out to be q square, b square, r square upon 2m. So this is equal to half um, Q square, B square, R square upon M square and that comes out to be Q square, B square, R square upon 2M. So this formula is for that kinetic energy. Now what is the practical use of this machine we call a cyclotron because now we have just started that it is based on the fact that the time for one revolution that we have taken as t it is independent of the speed and it is also independent here you see if you know the formula for this time period for one revolution it does not depend on the velocity or it does not depend on the radius so, so whenever the time for one revolution of an ion or a charged particle it is independent of its speed or its radius of the orbit then what we can do we can simply Use a cyclotron machine to bombard nuclei with energetic particles. So, the energetic particles which are accelerated by using the cyclotron and it is used to study the nuclear reactions 
and it is also used to implant ions into the solid which have many many applications when you can implant certain types of ions into the particular materials into solids and we can modify their properties and we can synthesize new type of material so that is a very interesting research it is an ongoing research and it is coming up you can embed this particle or you can bombard this particle so whenever you are using high energy or charged particles then you can use this cyclotron and this is used to modify the properties of the materials and synthesize new materials so it has a very interesting application so this cyclotron is very important a machine so go through it write down all the formulas make the diagram and make the concepts clear in mind keep on going so that's all for this lecture if you like this then like and share and subscribe to our channel for this class so that you can receive notifications for more such lectures and numerical problems solved. Thank you so much.